Warriors of Reddit, what was your hold it moment where you knew you would win? Story one, I was testifying for the defense. A young man had been arrested for assaulting a police officer, allegedly throwing bottles during some unrest in Oakland, following the verdict in the trial for the cop who Oscar Grant in the back on the BART platform. I had been there filming stuff, caught his arrest on video, and his brother found my footage on YouTube and asked me to testify. I had only seen bottles being thrown from this one corner of a parking lot from behind me with the bottles flying over my shoulder. The defendant was in a group in front of me. On the stand, the prosecutor seemed to think I knew the defendant and was there basically committing perjury on his behalf. I explained why I had been there that night, that I had never seen this guy before, hadn't been coached by the defense, and hadn't been paid other than a small amount for my travel and time. Finally, exasperated after much back and forth, the prosecutor says, well, if you don't know the defendant, then why are you here testifying for him? I thought for a moment and said, I guess I just wouldn't want an innocent man to get convicted for a crime he didn't commit. He got visibly flustered and quickly moved on, trying to insinuate that if I didn't know him, how would I have known to be looking in his direction to see whether he was throwing things? And I tried explaining that if you're looking at a group of random people and one of them throws something, you will naturally fixate your attention on that person. But because nobody in that group threw anything, there was nothing to notice in the first place. It looked like the police just grabbed him at random. They rested, the defense attorney bought me lunch down the street, and then he got a call from his colleague that the jury took all of 10 minutes to return a not guilty verdict on the assault charge. They said my response was legendary, though, and that no attorney should ever ask a question they don't already know the answer to. This guy just seemed to have a narrative about a prior relationship to the defendant that he assumed was accurate and was trying to call my credibility into question. Story 2. When the petitioner's attorney called me my brother's name when I was on the stand. My brother is a, and I don't associate with him anymore, but dude has a lengthy criminal history and it pops up on traffic stops occasionally. So I was in court over custody of my oldest and her mom's attorney was trying to paint me as a hypocrite for being an addict. I denied it all on the stand and he said, now, James, I must remind you that you are under oath, and by denying this, you are committing perjury. I stared him dead in the face and said, My name is Bill. James is my brother. Even the judge laughed at him, and the only reason we didn't bring it up sooner, we knew he submitted it as evidence but had no idea why, was because I really wanted to know what he was up to with it all. Story 3. We had some huge issues with a landlord, trying to enter without letting us know beforehand, not answering to fix issues, very aggressive when talking with us, when he decided to sell the place. He didn't check with us about the visits and just showed up randomly with potential buyers. We told him to get lost. He eventually left but called us the same evening to threaten us. We sent emails to remind him of our rights as tenants, and he answered by threatening us some more, in an email. We eventually end up in small issues court, not from the U.S., don't know the name, and he fabricates a story about how we are terrible tenants and we try to discourage buyers. We just showed the judge the emails as well as the open complaint to the police we filled a few days earlier. The judge couldn't believe it and gave him a formal warning, gave us three free months of rent. In the end, the guy just used a real estate company to sell the place. All went smoothly, and we still live there with lovely landlords that aren't completely bonkers. Story 4. My client was riding his motorcycle on a relatively calm street when this guy exited his garage without looking and run over him. In deposition, the guy brought a witness that was with him on the passenger seat. The whole time, the witness maintained that my client was driving too fast and that there was no time to break the car. I asked him the same question a few times in different ways, making him tell the story again. In the fourth telling, he, already a bit frustrated, let it slip. Look, I've already told you. We were exiting the garage, and as soon as I lifted up from getting my cell phone on the car's carpet, wait, so you didn't even see the crash? There was no coming back from that. Story 5. Parent termination case I was prosecuting. Dad went on how he has changed his life around and worked the AA program. Asked him what step he was on, and he proudly proclaimed three. Asked him what step three is, he had no idea. Then asked him step two was. Again, no idea. Parental rights. Story six. It was my third month of practice. I was in family law at the time, representing mom in a petition for a restraining order against boyfriend dad. At issue in the broader case was child visitation, custody, support, etc. But today's hearing was just on the RO. We had pretty good facts, but it was mostly based on testimony of the parties. My client was way more reputable as a witness, so I was feeling confident. Ten minutes before the hearing, my client shows up. I give her a last-minute prep on what to expect, and then she says, I'm glad I'm going through with this. I can't deal with it anymore, and he's just getting worse. 
To top it off, he left me a drunken, ranting voicemail on Saturday. You have your phone with you? Yes. We play the voicemail, and it's a full two minutes of ex-boyfriend screaming cow like, I should have flipping terminated you when we were together. You were always such a bad person. I hope you burn to death in a fire. I didn't have time to ask her why the fudge she hadn't said anything to me about the voicemail before the bailiff called our case. We sit, the judge asks if either side has additional evidence, and I ask for permission to play the voicemail. Ex-boyfriend who didn't have an attorney didn't object, so I played the whole nasty two-minute rant in open court. Judge goes, we're going to take a brief recess before I issue my ruling. If the parties want to meet and confer in the hall, they are welcome to. Boyfriend knew he was messed up. We settled the whole oh no case then and there. My client got her wish list in terms of custody, supervised visitation, child support, plus the restraining order to boot. Story 7. When I practiced insurance defense, was handed a file to take over of a slip and fall. Guy tripped on a hose, tore his L. The partner had taken the guy's depot already, so I read the transcript. I'm a Michigan football fan. Watched every game for 20 years. This guy testified he was the starting safety for a certain rival for certain years. Also that he graduated with a double major that doesn't exist at that school. I immediately knew this was false. Partner didn't understand. Dug deeper, lied about so much stuff unrelated to the fall for no reason. Eventually found high school records from football injuries of head trauma, knee injuries, oh and a slip and fall injury a few months after ours. He also testified he rehabbed an ACL surgery after one month. Motion for fraud on the court filed, immediately settled. Story 8. Not a lawyer, but I'm currently in a custody battle. Mother is saying I can't be trusted because I've been refusing to take our child to the therapist. The therapist testified I couldn't bring our child in because therapy must have both parents' consent, and mother has retracted consent. Story 9. Very abbreviated. I was prosecuting a convenience store owner for luring a young girl, who regularly came into the store, back to a part of the store to grope fondle and kiss her. Child enticement. It was the only section of the store without surveillance camera coverage. They were in the back room for about 2 minutes and 17 seconds per the timestamp on the videos. Of the many arguments the defense put on, one was there was no way there was enough time for anything to happen. In my rebuttal on closing, I asked the jury to imagine what could happen in the room in that amount of time. And I asked them to all close their eyes while I timed out 2 minutes and 17 seconds on my watch, in silence. After about 60 seconds, two of the jurors started crying. Knew it was going to be guilty right then. Story 10. Sued a former employer for $3,500 in unpaid wages. It was a slam dunk. Had a letter stating what my salary would be versus pay stubs that were less. IMO. So I didn't bother getting a lawyer to save on fees. Turns out the company thought they could. Try the same strategy. I show up to court and the manager of the local office is there with an affidavit from the CEO saying he's allowed to represent the company in court. The judge asks him, are you an attorney? No, just an employee. A company can't have pro C representation. Judge immediately ruled in my favor. Felt flipping fantastic. Story 11. I worked on a case involving defective processors. In discovery, we got emails from the defendant's engineers that had worked on the processors. They were in an Asian country, but the emails were in English because they were going to U.S. executives. One of the more senior engineers basically laid out the exact defect we were suing over, explaining what the problem was and why it was their fault, and finishing with, this is big problem. We ship nonsense to customers. Needless to say, we hit them over the head with that in mediation, and they settled shortly after. Story 12. I represented an elderly Indian couple who didn't speak English very well and owned a rental property. They had a tenant at the time who had not paid rent in over six months. They had tried to evict her on their own, but when they got to court, the tenant produced some handwritten notes, which they had given her the year prior thanking her for payment but they failed to date the notes. Of course, the tenant added recent dates herself. The tenant also produced a partial certified check receipt, but most of it was illegible. Anyway, because of their poor English, they had difficulty understanding the questions and giving intelligent answers, so they lost the initial case. They hired me to help address all of the various lies that the tenant was putting forth. Anyway, we refiled. I had my clients pull the banking records so we could show the date that the certified check was actually deposited into their account. The plan was simple. Let the tenant make the same arguments and then present the banking statements showing the deposit date. My clients also found a photocopy of one of their notes, but it was undated, unlike the copy the tenant presented the last time. Well, when the judge finally understood that the things the tenant had presented occurred the year before, his cheeks turned bright red and he asked the tenant, what year did you make this payment? The tenant started saying something like she couldn't be exactly sure when, and the judge her off again in a very loud voice, what year? Needless to say, the clients got their eviction granted. Bonus content. When the tenant arrived at court, I watched as she got out of her car, 
walked to the back and pulled out a wheelchair and proceeded to stay in that wheelchair until the case was over. Once the judge left the courtroom, she folded up the wheelchair and carried it to her car, mumbling that she hates lawyers. Anyway, that was a very satisfying day. Story 13. Obligatory, not mine, but my mom's story. She was fighting for custody on behalf of the father, trying to prove that the kids were living in subpar conditions with their candy addict mother, in spite of the ample child support provided. It was a tough case because courts are so hesitant to pull kids away from their moms. Then the mom burst out that she had been feeding the kids cat food as proof that she wouldn't let them starve. Needless to say, the judge didn't take that as a good reason for the kids to stay with their mom. Story 14. At a restraining order trial, it was essentially my client's word versus his. Regarding a close relationship assault, he did a good job dressing up and acting very appropriate during most of his testimony. But then he was asked a series of open-ended questions, and he said something to the effect that she kept coming up on me with that flipping cat, allegedly during a lecture. And as soon as he said it, a look came on his face and the judge's face, and everyone knew the ruse of respectable young gentlemen had failed. I won. Story 15. My client was accused of brutally murdering a dog. Cop testified that there was no testing of the blood, no body ever found, and admitted it could have in fact run away. The eyewitness said she could see the terminating down the hallway from the dining room. Cop testified there was no hallway and the dining room was on a different level of the house than the terminating supposedly took place. Then the person who was leading the lynch mob against my client around town for the last year testified that she had been in the apartment between the two visits by the cop to evaluate the scene. No body, a compromised crime scene, witness who couldn't see anything, and admission that there was no proof the dog was dead. Closing argument lasted three seconds. Your Honor, I'm asking for an acquittal. Edit. My first award, thanks. For those who asked, this was in Canada and received a fair bit of media attention prior to trial. Story 16. Not a lawyer, but we had no evidence that the woman who slammed into my stopped car going 85 miles per hour was drunk until she indignantly admitted it on tape in her deposition. She busted into my deposition and demanded she go first because I was a lying bad person. She excitedly told my lawyer that the police report was wrong because it said she was coming from the movie theater when she was actually coming from her friend's bar. Did you have anything to drink at your friend's bar? Of course. How many drinks? I don't know. They just keep my glass full. Did you take any medicine that day? Methadone and low blood pressure medicine? I see. The cops had refused to breathalyze her at the scene because her husband was a firefighter that they knew personally. They told her to go home, sober up, and go to the hospital later. I heard the whole thing but had no proof until she handed it to me. They settled same day. Story 17. Not a lawyer. Years ago, I had to do something at a strip mall in a bad part of town. Took me about 20 minutes, and then I found that my car had been towed. Ubered to the tow yard. Giant sign says cash only. Had to call another Uber. Drive to the ATM and back and pay them dollar three hundred some bucks. Got a poor handwritten receipt that, believe it or not, was itemized. Went home, Googled, found that they violated the law in three separate ways towed illegally, illegally refused to accept credit cards, and had multiple charges that the law called unreasonable, like dolly fees and load-unload fees. Took them to small claims court. The judge began by asking the tow yard owner about his relationship with the property owner and how the decision was made to tow my car. Oh, the slimy tow truck dude answered. My cousin works there. If he says tow, I tow. It's a hundred percent legal! The judge's eyebrows begin to rise. But, the dude continued, but what I detest the most, your honor, is this unpleasant person claiming I don't take credit cards. I'm a businessman. I take credit cards all the time. He's a lowlife that does not have any credit cards. That's why he wanted to pay cash. I was having a hold it overload, and the judge saw me smiling and hopping in my seat and patting my manila folder of receipts. Do you actually not have any credit or debit cards? The judge asked. I pulled out my wallet and showed him, and then I pulled out a time-stamped photo of the cash-only sign I took the day of and another one I took the morning of the hearing. The guy mumbled something like, Okay, you got me there, and then had nothing but, huh, I didn't know that, when the judge asked him about the legality of each unreasonable, itemized charge. Anyway, each violation pays double the total tow charge, and since there were three, that's how I made $1,800 on a $300 investment. Story 18. I was reviewing the transcript of an interview with a child. The child made incriminating statements against my client. At one point, when discussing the allegations, the child used an odd word, but I didn't think much of it. A few days later, I was watching a video of the child interacting with their grandmother, who hates my client, from about a week before that interview. The grandmother used the exact same odd word in the exact context the child later used it. At that moment, it became clear that child had been coached. 
It was the first real aha moment of my career. Story 19. When I found a video on Facebook of the plaintiff squatting 300 pounds the month before his deposition. That was a good one. Oh, he was saying he couldn't work and had back injuries after a minor car accident. Edit. Just as a follow-up, I sent the video to his attorney afterward the deposition and the case immediately went away. He also adamantly denied being able to work out or doing any lifting during his deposition. It was a big lie. Also, I agree that this really sucks for the people with legitimate injuries, who people quickly want to just label litigious. Story 20. I can't believe I'm about to use the not a lawyer, but loan, but here goes. Lowell tried to sell my home myself, and the buyers wanted a term period for land contract before getting their own mortgage. I agreed to one year, had a simple contract drawn up, and after we both signed it, everything seemed fine. Within 30 days, the present me with their own legally drawn up land contract that was pages long to protect their investment. About page 3, it very clearly stated that if for any reason the home burns down, purchaser will receive all insurance proceeds. First, I still had a mortgage and the proceeds would legally go to pay that off. Second, that's a pretty targeted thing to say. Not lawyers' terms of the house being destroyed and it's surrounded by woods and waterways just if it burnt down. Page 4 stated that this would remain a land contract until my mortgage was paid in full, so they'd never buy outright. I returned it to them with a letter stating those two things were never happening and I wasn't signing. They stopped paying, so I began eviction. Six months later, the lawyer I hired was an idiot, and I'm sitting down with their lawyer myself. He brings out the contract they'd tried giving me and began talking about their ironclad case due to the agreement. I asked him to show me my signature, the look on his face when he realized it wasn't there. After we talked, it turned out he knew them and wrote the contract without the burn the house down stipulation. Seems they added it. And under the belief it was a long-term land contract. Not only did I win, I'm pretty sure they lost a lawyer friend. Story 21. Bought a hurricane door from a contractor that was found through our state's hurricane readiness website. He took 5K and after about three weeks of car or scheduling issues, finally just ghosted us. Took him and his company to court. The him and his company part is important. Finally, court day shows up and I'm fairly young and an optimistic, so I figure I don't need a lawyer. Plus, the local news station took my story and came out to interview me to do a bit on it. I figure it is a fairly obvious case, easy win. I put on my best, only, $99 suit and head downtown. Dude doesn't show but instead sent his company's office manager. We get settled in with the arbiter. First thing I was wrong about, oh cow, not court court with a judge and cow, and the office manager starts in that they deny my claims and in fact are countersuing me for canceling the contract. I start to sweat, like, oh cow, they're going after me? What happens if they believe them? I'm going to be out 5K and have to pay them more? FML. The arbiter listens to her and then asks me to tell my side. I told him, plus showed documentation of what I had did and when. Arbiter dude looks at her and says, He has enough to prove you wrong by even if he didn't, because your boss Michael Blah Blah couldn't even be bothered to show up when he himself was specifically named in the suit. I'm ruling in the plaintiff's favor. Cue me trying not to happy dance or look to smug before I got out of that room. Side note, just because you win a judgment against someone, that doesn't mean you will get paid. You still owe me $5K, Michael. Story 22. Not exactly a knew-you-would-win moment, but I got a hidden shout-out from a federal judge in a ruling that I consider to be one of the high points of my career. Here's what happened. Before a hearing for an emergency injunction against USDA, I was watching the hearing before mine, a trademark infringement case. At the end of that hearing, the judge accidentally used a pun and could not stop laughing. She was literally crying. I decided at that moment I was going to intentionally use a pun in my hearing. I did. I accused USDA of engaging in a shell game by illegally diverting some federal funds to an egg industry trade group. The judge called me on it, but laughed heartily. My client won. The judge threatened to put the Secretary of Agriculture in jail. A major newspaper reporting on the case said the judge winced at my puns, but agreed with my arguments. Falza! When the written ruling was issued, the last sentence said that an injunction was issued against USDA's use of the funds for any plans they may be hatching. Undeniable shout-out. Story 23. Not a lawyer, but was working as a paralegal for a law firm. We were defending a claim which had run into tens of thousands of pounds against our client, a holiday home, by a woman who had tripped over a speed bump while walking back to her caravan and damaged her knee. The fall was genuine. The question was whose fault this was. She claimed it was the holiday home's fault because she hadn't seen the speed bump due to low lighting, poor marking, etc. The claim had outrageously gone to months and made it to court. Going through the various questions to her, when our barrister asked how she knew the speed bump was poorly marked or something similar, her response, well, I remember thinking how it wasn't well marked when I was walking up to it. Needless to say, it was a short day in court after that point. 
Story 24. Not a lawyer, but I played one in small claims court. My lease had an exit clause that said if I fronted two months' rent, they would work to lease my place and return anything unused. I checked with the office ahead of time. They ensured me there was a waiting list, so I gave them the two months and moved. They never returned a dime. I talked to the new tenant and confirmed they moved in a week later. In court, the judge was commenting on how he didn't see anything explicitly saying they would return any unused rent, even though that intent was stated to me a few times. Dumbo from the leasing office piped in with, Your Honor, in almost every case we can return some money, but in this case we didn't have a tenant in the two months after he left. So she gave the case back to me, and I presented the affidavit from the new tenant, confirming the move-in date. Judge awarded me double what they owed. Turns out leasing office Dumbo's one and two thought they could lie to me and return my excess rent money to themselves. Story 25. I clerk for a judge, and we had a low-level thief in our courtroom who had robbed one of his neighbor's houses in the winter in Colorado, and all the police had to do was follow the footsteps back to his house, where he was hanging out with the stolen items and a small amount of sweets and a poor handgun. Idiot. Edited for clarity. Story 26. Not a layer, but my girlfriend had a very minor nose to tail, and a rookie cop who happened to drive by booked her on some massive charges and fines. She went to trial and her lawyer tore apart the cop. In the report, he filed the officer ticked her ethnicity as African. She's white European. Put the wrong date, the wrong street name, and didn't get the other witnesses' details. The prosecution officer argued that she had signed the witness statement, so while a few things were accidentally filled out wrong, it reflected what happened. Her lawyer asked to the officer show the court her signature on the statement. He looked at it and said, Oh, I must have forgot it. The prosecutor and a few police that went to the trial for some reason all let out audible groans. The judge adjourned for 10 minutes. The police still wanted to press on, but the judge threw it out immediately after recess and gave the prosecutor an earful for taking such a ridiculous case to trial. Story 27. Not a lawyer. I was a volunteer family advocate. I worked with families who were falsely accused of child abuse. Part of that was going to court with them. I was contacted by a family whose children were in foster care because of parental candy use. The family claimed that they didn't do sweets and that no one would believe them. They had a court-appointed attorney who did nothing but tell them to stop using sweets. I honestly didn't believe them. I was pretty jaded. I told them to request their case file for me to review. I was surprised when they called me back and had the case file. I met with them and went through everything. I noticed claims of candy use, court findings of candy use, but no test results in their paperwork. I told them to ask for the results. Long story short, the caseworker wouldn't give them the actual results, and the lab wouldn't either. So I candy tested them myself at a different lab. They tested clean. Color me shocked. There were four months to go until the next court date. Every time CPS candy tested them, they went right after to the other lab and did a second test. All clean. I told them to tell the lawyer beforehand that if CPS claimed any dirty candy tests, to ask in court for the test results. He didn't want to. I was starting to get mad. So the day of court, I had a stack of clean candy test results in my bag. The lawyer wouldn't even look at them, and he was openly hostile to my presence and involvement. Court starts. I had been in this judge's courtroom before, with other families. The CPS supervisor stands up and says that the parents have had 12 dirty candy screens in the past six months. The lawyer actually did ask her for the results. She said she didn't have them with her. I got the results out of my bag and handed them to the mom who was next to the lawyer. She tried to get him to take them, but he ignored her. I got so agitated that the judge said, Mrs. Baez looks like she's about to have a stroke. What's going on? I stood up and explained that we had clean candy tests taken immediately after the mandated ones that CPS claimed were dirty. I briefly explained that the parents had tried getting copies of their results and had been refused. I said that the parents had consistently denied ever using sweets and had clean tests to prove it. Uh... The judge ordered CPS to provide copies of all the candy test results at a hearing in a week. Of pain. At that hearing, the case was closed and the children were released from foster care. The family never got an apology from anyone, but they were too traumatized to pursue it. They packed up and moved away within a month. Story 28. Not a lawyer, but just a very observant girlfriend. My BF's car was involved in an accident. He was parked in an area where during certain hours you were not permitted to park as it would block semis from being able to maneuver to deliver goods. It was a steel plant. A girl backed her vehicle in his driver's side door of his Ford Fusion. Cops were called for insurance purposes, and my BF states that it appeared the cop and the girl knew each other. They were on a first-name basis. He received a parking ticket. It took forever for the insurance companies to sort it out because she didn't think she was at fault because he was parked illegally. That doesn't matter or make legal for you to hit someone's car and get off scot-free. She ended up having to pay for his deductible. And this is where the harassment from the local PD began. 
He received a piece of mail from our magistrate stating he failed to pay a parking ticket and a bench warrant would be issued if he didn't pay it or he could request a hearing regarding the ticket. He was just going to pay it. I looked over the paperwork and found that the vehicle they said he parked illegally was traded in before the ticket was issued. The ticket indicted a white Toyota Tundra, but the license plate block was not filed out. It was signed, but you could not make out the badge number. We had traded his Toyota Tundra on a Ford Fusion in December. The ticket was written in Feb of the following year. I was pretty pissed. I gather all the evidence for him, trade and paperwork, and he went before the magistrate. Cop testified that he saw a white Toyota Tundra illegally parked at a certain location that had a parking time restriction, and it was owned by my BF when he ran the tags. I should note that my BF had had several parking tickets while he owned the Toyota Tundra. That's as our guess on how he got just enough info to write the ticket. My BF presented his evidence and the judge dismissed the case. The judge was heard to say to the cop that he would like to speak to him afterward and chastised him for wasting the court's time. The cop later told me BF that had he contacted him, they could have taken care of it outside of getting the magistrate involved. Needless to say, we haven't had an issue since. Story 29 yeah, now, but a friend of mine was a DWI attorney in New York for a while. He was defending a guy who was asleep in the backseat of his car while intoxicated and a NYS trooper arrested him. On the stand, the trooper testified that he visually saw the key in the ignition. My friend gave him like three chances to walk it back. Are you sure, trooper, that you actually saw the key in the ignition? Yes, counselor. When a cop calls a lawyer counselor, he really means unpleasant person. And then my buddy dropped the hammer. You are aware that my client drives a Toyota Prius? Bam. Edit. 13 hours later. For all the people pointing out that there's a spot for the fob in the dashboard of some Prius models, etc., you have to understand that in a court of law, words have meanings. Ignition is most certainly specifically defined in NYS law as being what we all commonly understand as the ignition. The point is that the trooper, since their main duty is traffic enforcement on the roads, are expected to be experts on the cars. Also, he lied on the stand. He wasn't mistaken, he made it up and got caught. Yes, in NY, having the keys on your person while in the car is being under control of the vehicle and thus can be arrested for DUI, DUI, but you can't sever the perjured testimony from the rest of the case. He lied. He got caught. My buddy moved for immediate dismissal, and the DA didn't argue. Case dismissed. Nothing happened to the trooper. As to why the trooper did this, promotions over time. Imagine you're running the entire New York State Police. You have about 5,000 troopers. What metric do you use to gauge how effectively they're performing their tasks? For the most part, troopers ride alone. So, Trooper Hash 1 drives around all day on his shift and issues zero tickets and makes zero arrests. Trooper Hash 2 manages to issue, say, five tickets a day and makes a DWI arrest four times a month? You're going to assume that Trooper Hash 2 is doing his job. An aggressive officer is one that has a lot of tickets and a lot of arrests. Also, court appearances are almost always on overtime. Police unions are very specific about overtime pay rates and when they apply. If you're an effective trooper and you write lots of tickets, you're going to be in court a lot at 1.5, your hourly rate, sometimes 2.0, your hourly rate, depending. Also, ha, ha, Anil, INL has long been internet speak for I am not a lawyer. Story 30, not during trial. Happened to me personally. I got into a car accident. Another driver crashed into my car. The driver was such an unpleasant person, talking tough, blaming me, saying that he knew a bunch of lawyers. And here's the kicker. He threatened that he was going to take me to court. I'm a laid-back dude in contrast, and I was cordial to him. We went to the police station and made our statements to the traffic investigator. I didn't have a dash cam at the time, but a day later I got a copy of the CCTV footage that was looking directly at the scene of the accident. I showed the investigator the video, and he was absolutely stunned how wrong the other guy was. At that point, I told the investigator that I was an attorney, and that I'd decide if I wanted to take the matter to court. Following day, I got a call from the guy who hit me. Apparently, he said he also saw the CCTV footage, and he had called to settle things. I was just shocked because this dude who was previously Mr. Alpha Male did a total 180 and was suddenly polite and respectful. Amazing what an impact video has. Story 31. Watched my lawyer have this moment last time we were in court. Short version. My ex abused my kid. I withheld visitation and hired a lawyer. I offered supervised visitation with a plan to integrate regular visitation once he completed anger management and parenting classes, as well as had six months clean of all substances. When he was on the stand, he mentioned that he had been taking prescription meds for 10 years to illustrate that he's been on meds for a decade and never had a problem being a good dad. Lawyer asked what meds, and he listed off a bunch. Meds like methadone, clonopin, Vicodin, Oxycontin, etc. She asked why he began taking those particular medications. 
He replied, well, I messed up my back last year riding my quad. She asked him to repeat himself. He said it again. The look on her face was amazing. She said, so you've been taking large amounts of meds for 10 years? He said, yes. She said, 10 years of major medications due to an injury that happened two years ago? TL Dr. Judge agreed with my request for supervised visits pending his completion of all the necessary steps. X never completed any steps and kiddo hasn't had to see him in four years. Story 32. I had a ton of these when I used to do family law. Off the top of my head, my client's husband was alleging she had been high and in public. As I'm crossing him, I get him to admit that she was in fact changing out of her bathing suit at the beach and covered by a towel at all times. He says, well, she was under the towel, I come back with, just like you're under your clothes right now. Even the judge chuckled. Story 33. Not a lawyer was contesting a speeding ticket. In front of the judge, it went like this. Judge, Mr. Crookeye, you were given a ticket for doing 40 in a 30 area that's also a school zone on Turnpike Road. How do you plead? Me. Your Honor, there is no school zone on Turnpike Road. The judge looks at the paper again, then looks at the bailiff. There isn't a school zone there, is there? Bailiff. No, judge. Not to my recollection, judge. Hmm. Well, I guess you're free to go, Mr. Crookeye. Have a nice night. In case you didn't know, if the officer writes up the ticket incorrectly, it has to be thrown out entirely. Also, I don't think the officer was trying to get me on extra charges on purpose. There was one of those signs at the top of a hill that warns of a bus stop over the crest of the hill. Think he just got confused. Story 34. Not a lawyer, but self-defended myself against an utterly nonsense charge of using my cell phone, which was turned off charging, while driving. When the cop pulled me over and said it was because he saw me using my cell phone at a light, I told him that was impossible. It was turned off, and I would happily turn it back on and show him it hadn't been used in over 10 mins. He refused to see it and wrote the ticket. $590, I was pissed. I'll own up if I make a mistake. I once got a ticket for going 81 in a 60 zone that I thought was an 80. I didn't even fight because I was in the wrong even if I wasn't knowingly speeding. But this was complete nonsense. I didn't really think I had a chance but hoped the cop wouldn't show. My luck he did, and then the prosecutor showed me his statement. He lied and said I told him I had just been checking my messages. Well, when he pulled me over and I told him I'd show him my phone, I took screenshots of my call list, my email account, and my text messages, all of which showed the time of the screenshot and the last CalMail retrieval text sent or received. Judge let me admit them as evidence because his statement specifically indicated I admitted doing something relevant to the screenshots. And they of course proved that I had not used the phone for any of those things. Strike one against him. Then, when he testified, he said that he had seen me pull my phone out of the cup holder, look at it, and put it back in. My phone was on a dash mount when he pulled me over. So I asked him about the cup holder and he said it was dash mounted. I actually had a picture of the interior of my car because I thought maybe he's seen me touching the screen of my car's controls. I drive a Prius. So I'd taken a picture of the interior. That, of course, showed the cup holders are not on the dash and instead are in a console in between the driver and passenger seats. Strike two against him. Finally, I produced my cell phone records that showed I owned an iPhone 6 Plus at the time of the ticket. I asked him again if he was certain I'd put it in a cup holder, and he said he was. He could hardly change his story on the stand. So I took a cup that was on the desk, in case people needed water during the trial, and set it and my phone in front of him and asked him to try to put my phone into the cup. Six plus phones were hutched and I use an OtterBox Defender. There was no way it would fit in a cup holder. He glared at me and said, Well, the cup holders in my truck are big. It would fit in them. I reminded him the ticket showed I drive a Prius, and they are not a big car. Third strike? Three times I proved that what he said could not have happened. The judge at this point interrupted. She said at the start she would provide advice since I was representing myself, and that was part of her job, and said I'd made my point and did it very well. That was when I knew I'd won. And boy, was that cop pissed. But it was a glorious moment for me. Story 35. I'm not a lawyer, but I've been up against plenty of them as a union chief steward. Years ago, we had an arbitration related to healthcare costs. The company spent the better part of a year trying to break us from pursuing the case. The day had come for our arbitration. The lawyer, there were three actually, we were up against was actually Paul Newman's nephew. Anyway, it was my turn to take the stand. His first question to me was presenting the grievance as evidence and asking me what step it said it was on at the top of the page. Our grievance process is a two-step system, progressing to arbitration if it's not settled. I said, second step. Then he smugly asks, and where is the first step? To which I replied, the first step is a verbal discussion. It goes into writing at the second step. He looked hurt, but persevered anyway. A few more questions in, he asked, if the entire company got base level insurance instead of a premium option, 
that would satisfy the contract. At this point, he was hoping I would argue that the base level insurance wasn't sufficient because he was trying to paint the picture that we were just trying to get premium insurance at a base level price. I responded with yes. He looked dumbfounded, asked me yes. I said again, yes, that would satisfy the language in the contract. He kind of looked at his other papers he was going to submit as evidence, then muttered, no further questions. I knew at that moment that they had brought no real argument to the table. We got our answer from the arbitrator six weeks later, during a contract negotiations meeting. It was insanely satisfying watching them read the email during one of the sessions, and the immediate shift in demeanor from their side of the table. They got real quiet. We were awarded 100% of the arbitration, full back pay for all employees that were being overcharged and reduced rate for the premium insurance. Story 36, I sort of have an opposite. He knew when he lost it one. When I was about four years old, I was ill one day, and the only option my parents had to take care of me was for my dad to take me to work with him. My dad was an attorney, and work was the courthouse where he was arguing a case that day. My dad knew the judge, and I was allowed to lay down on a bench during arguments from the two attorneys present, dad and opposing counsel. I was a pretty well-behaved kid, I guess, and was quiet and just sort of laid down on the bench and stayed silent. I have vague memories of the incident, but nothing really defined. As my dad tells the story, the judge grew bored at one point, looked over to me, waved and gave me a smile, and commented on how well-behaved I'd been during all of it. Dad said it was at that moment the opposing counsel knew he'd lost the argument, and subsequently, the case. Dad joked about needing to take me to court more often. Story 37. I'm arguing a motion for summary judgment in front of a judge who has never ruled my way on anything ever. I was expecting to go home with nothing. He's holding the hearing in chambers, so we're all sitting around a conference table. I make my arguments and say, and I have six recent cases all supporting this. He says, and you brought cases. That's amazing. I thought he was being sarcastic, and he was, but not for the reason I thought. While I thought my motion was dead in the water, he was a step ahead of me. He didn't need to see my precedent. I finish my 10-minute presentation, and then it's opposing counsel's turn. She starts arguing, and when she's done, I say, may I have one minute for rebuttal? The judge says, you're not going to need that. And just like that, it clicked. He was ruling in my favor. In fact, he'd known all along my motion was solid because he'd read it. He'd denied my last two motions on discovery matters because he knew where this case was going. He knew he was going to grant summary judgment, and there was no point. He granted my motion, and that was it. I won the case. No trial necessary. It's rare to get summary judgment in my area of practice, and I was stunned. Excited, but stunned. That was my last hearing with him before he retired. It made me rethink how I size up judges. My expectations were completely wrong, and I should have given him more credit walking into the hearing. Story 38. The plaintiff was being deposed in the lawsuit she filed alleging close relationship discrimination. She was claiming her boss had made some inappropriate innuendos and overtures. The defense attorney asked her if when the alleged statements or events took place, was she shocked? No. Was she offended? No. Was she damaged in any way? No. So why exactly are we here? Well, honestly, I'd rather not be. Meanwhile, her attorney stared straight down scribbling notes dude. We ended the deposition there and asked her attorney if this was going away now. We got a call later offering to settle for $1,000 and a letter of apology. My best guess is she was pressured by a friend or family to talk to an attorney, and the lawyers ran with it without really talking to their client. Story 39. My attorney had this moment in my initial consultation with him for my BWI charge. Yes, boating. The sheriff's department conducted the field sobriety tests on the deck or their small vessel in a heavily traveled waterway rather than taking me to dry land. Charges were thrown immediately out after my attorney brought this to the attention of the DA. Edit. I should add, this attorney was a sheriff's deputy on Marine Patrol for 12 years prior to going to law school. I interviewed three different attorneys and he was the last. The other two quoted me $35K for the defense. He said that he would never tell a client a case is a slam dunk, but he charged $700 and said he would see the case through trial it, it didn't get dismissed with no additional fee. It was thrown out by the end of the week. Story 40. It wasn't at trial, but during a deposition on a case where two former employees decided to start their own company in a very niche market, but decided to make their plans on company laptops, they unsuccessfully tried to brick. One of the defendants was the one being deposed. She said she answered to a higher power than the company. When pressed on what that meant, she said, herself. That got reused prominently at trial. Edit. Because multiple people have asked and finding a clarification in the replies might be annoying. There isn't anything illegal about wanting to leave one company and start your own. The problem was how they did it, which was trying to poach existing clients while still employed, which breached their fiduciary duty, particularly of loyalty. I believe we also went after them for intentional interference with contract, as they weren't trying to solicit new clients for their business, 
but rather trying to get existing ones to break their contracts with our client. Using the company laptop to try to do it just made it way easier to catch them when the company IT guy found all the emails. And for privacy reasons, I won't say what industry it was, but to the person who asked, no, it was not a high-end escort service. I've never had to deal with one of those. I did have to ask a witness once about a sugar daddy website once, though, so that was fun. Story 41. My grandfather was a small-town Georgia lawyer, and he told of a time he was representing an insurance company in a civil suit after a car accident. The plaintiff claimed to have received whoopneck from the accident, supposedly caused by my grandfather's client. Pop asked him what exactly he meant by whoopneck, and the plaintiff, wearing a neck brace, proceeded to answer, it's when you can't move your head like this. And then he shook his head back and forth. The judge promptly dismissed the case. Story 42. I'm not a lawyer, but I took my old landlord to court when I was in college. They stole my security deposit over nonsense. They claimed I trashed the place, not knowing that I took pictures and video when I moved in and out. Their evidence was a VHS quality recording of going through a perfectly clean apartment in better condition than it was when I moved in. But then they opened up the top of the stove and found a single piece of elbow macaroni under it, holding it up triumphantly. That was the crux of their argument. The judge was not amused, and I got all my money back plus my lawyer fees and the filing fee. She then fought against her own lawyer to avoid paying him. Unpleasant person. Edit. Anytime you move into a place, take pictures, take video, make notes about any damage. When you move out, do the same thing along with noting any repairs you made. Pretty hard to argue against solid evidence. Protect yourself. Story 43. Not a lawyer, a witness. Shoplifting case. During cross, examiner asks the accused, based on his testimony during his arrest, you listed place he shoplifted as your employer. Why? His response, I make so much from them every year, they might as well pay me. Public defender just collapsed. 